جاء الآن موعد المتحدث الرسمي الأول في المؤتمر جيل غرافيير المدير والاستشاري الأول في البرمجيات المفتوحة المصدر وبلوك تشين شركة وبرو عنوان المحاضرة المصدر المفتوح محرك الثورتين الصناعيتين الثالثة والرابعة Now it's time for our first keynote speaker Mr. Jill Gravier Director and Senior Advisor, Open Source, Blockchain, Wepro Limited. The title of his talk is Open Source, the engine behind the third and fourth industrial revolutions. So, hello everybody. Thank you very much for um, having invited me to speak uh, today and tomorrow here at uh, the event. I'm very, very impressed by, uh, by the university, the your, your organization. So, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, um, to speak today about uh, the influence of open source on, on what is called the third and what is called the fourth industrial revolution. And, um, and it's an interesting debate on, on what is the fourth revolution, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So let me start um, first by talking about open source before we talk about the revolutions. And a little bit of history uh, to start with because open source is not something that's new. Um, it's, it's been very popular these days, but if we go back in time to the very beginning of computers, or not the very beginning, but some time ago in the computer age, um, all of the software that was available was available in source code. And it was there so that people could modify it, adapt it, run it. If you, if you look at it this way, even though it wasn't formalized uh, the way open source is formalized nowadays, it was open source. You could, you could take your software and you could play with it and you could run it and it was free. And then, after some time, um, people realized that software was really important for running, uh, for running computer systems. And there was a big lawsuit that sort of triggered an avalanche of, uh, of events and activities. It happened in 1969 in the US, where the US government decided that giving your operating system free with your hardware was uncompetitive. Basically, it would allow IBM to have a monopoly because since they were giving the software away, um, it made their machines more easy to use and, more, uh, and, and people were not encouraged to, to try the competition. So, so IBM was forced to, to stop bundling the software for free and that sort of triggered the, um, the idea that software should become a commercial and soon proprietary um, a proprietary, proprietary, oh, that's a hard one, proprietary uh, thing. That was kind of a, a, a slowdown if you look at, at the idea of open source, right? Suddenly, you couldn't have the software anymore and you had to buy it. Um, so, so take this as the, as the dark ages, if you want, of open source, right? It's kind of the bad times. And those bad times continued for, for a little bit until in uh, 1953, this guy, Richard Stallman, I don't know if any of you have met him, but he's quite an interesting character, um, figured out that programming and software was really a question of giving freedom to people. I will talk about what that freedom is a little later. But he said that software, he thought and felt that software uh, was an element of freedom because it lets you take control of, of what you did with your system, of what you did with your, basically, life as a programmer. And so he created, well, he invented the term free software. And, and by the way, keep in mind that free in this word means freedom, freedom to do things with it, not free as in zero cost, but it happens to be very often linked. And he created the Free Software Foundation, which has this little GNU um, as a symbol, and I've seen it uh, drawn everywhere uh, in, in, the, in the exhibition room, so you'll see that, that little animal again. So that's 1983. I would say that's the rebirth of, 
of free software and the appearance of the word free software. A little later on, 15-ish years afterwards, um, there was a company called Netscape. Anybody here remembers Netscape? Yay, okay, good. Um, that's, for me, that's what started the internet. Before, before 1994, um, people had machines that could communicate. There was email, and it was really limited to universities uh, exchanging information and the military. 1994, the first web browser appeared. Anybody remember the name of the first web browser? Mosaic? Well, Mosaic before. Mosaic, and then Netscape was built from Mosaic. And Netscape became the popular one. And in 1997, um, there was a meeting um, between uh, Eric Raymond, the guy over there, um, and, um, and Christine Peterson um, and the Netscape team. And suddenly, um, they felt and they realized that in the industrial world, um, there was a need for, uh, for, for sharing the source code of even big commercial uh, um, and business-oriented software like Netscape Navigator, which was really becoming the industry standard for, for surfing the web. And so they invented a new term called open source and, and created an organization called the Open Source Initiative, which was created to help identify and, and, and um, curate the idea and notion of open source software. And if you look at it from, from the outside, you have these two entities, Free Software Foundation, which talks about free software, an open source initiative, we talk to, which talks about open source. They're all defending the same idea, even though sometimes they argue on which one is better. I will talk now a little bit about the differences between the two so you understand what it, what it really is about. So the first one is the Free Software Foundation. Free Software Foundation defines software from, a, from an ethical perspective and looks at the freedom aspects. So when we're talking free software, we're saying, this is the freedom to do things with your software. And if you look at it, the first one is the freedom to run software the way you want for whatever you want, okay? And you'll see when we talk open source, it's in there as well. So free software means I can do what I want with it. Nobody should tell me it's not allowed to do this or not allowed to do that. Um, the next one, and this is really interesting because we're in the university here, is the freedom to study your software. So if you have a piece of software, you should be allowed to look inside exactly to see what it does and how it does it. Whether you want to learn from it or whether you want to check that it's doing what it says it's doing. In the cryptography world, we're looking at checking what it says it's doing. In the, uh, in, the, in the complex software, when you're looking at an operating system, you also want to learn. There's a lot of stuff to learn at looking the source code, looking at the source code of an operating system. And by the way, having the freedom to study means you need to have access to the code. Um, the next one is the freedom to redistribute copies of your software. So this is also interesting. When we have freedom, we should be able to give others these freedoms. So I have software, I should be able to give it to somebody else. This, this freedom is what makes free software zero cost software. Because if I can give it to anybody, even if I buy it myself, and I can redistribute it to anybody, then suddenly it becomes really hard for somebody to make money by selling it. We have to find other ways of selling um, software. I'll talk about that tomorrow, by the way. So, freedom to redistribute. And finally, freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions of your software. Uh, this is a really important one. When we're talking free software, you have access to code but you're encouraged to actually modify the code to tailor it to your needs to make it better, to make it bigger, to make it smaller, to remove things you don't like, to add things you find missing. And this is really interesting also from an innovation perspective, and when we're talking business from a speed to market perspective. If you have to wait for a software vendor to bring in the feature you want, it takes time, it can take two years, if that's the release cycle. If you're free to make the modifications yourself, or hire somebody to do it, you can do it maybe in a few weeks. So that's a really, really important part and a really strong, strong driver for the interest of open source. So for free software, sorry. So this is the definition of free software from the Free Software Foundation. It's still in effect and it still defines what free software is. Now, the open source initiative said, okay, 
in the business world, it's really hard to talk about freedom. Um, some places it's a hard word to use. I don't usually talk about freedom in China, for example. They don't react really well to it. Um, so I tend to talk about pillars. And the open source initiative actually defined open source in a slightly different way. They said, okay, we're going to set up 10 big key elements of open source. And if you've seen free software right before, they're very close. So the first one is the freedom to redistribute source code. Okay, I have a piece of software, I have access to the source code, I can redistribute it to anybody else. The source code must be available, that gives me the permission to do the first one. Allow derived works, that's the number three, the fourth rule in the free software. I can change the software, modify it, um, and, uh, and then, uh, because I can redistribute, I can make everybody benefit from it. So you see these rules are very similar. They've added things in there that weren't in the free software definition. The first one is the integrity of the author's source code. Every time somebody tells me, if I put my source code in the open source, I lose the control of it and nobody knows it's mine, there's, there's this big fuzzy area about it. Well, actually, no. Source code remains copyrighted to the person. The person's original name is in there, has to be in there. The original source code has to remain available. So that's a really important thing. You do not lose control on your software when you make it open source, ever. No discrimination against persons of groups. So I can't say these people are not allowed to use it. Or against field of endeavor. That's rule zero of free software. I can use it for whatever I want. OK, freedom to use for whatever I want. I must distribute a license with my code, even if I redistribute the code. This is really important, because every time I use and redistribute free software, people must be able to see that it is free software as well. I cannot hide the fact that it's free software or else I'm in violation of a free software license. Um, and licenses must not be specific to a product or restrict other software or be, and they have to be technology neutral. This means that I cannot create an open source license that says only runs for smart cards or only runs for my software. If an open source license has the open source label on it, it must be general purpose. So when you use and select an open source license, like the GPL, if you've heard of it, or the BSD license, they are all technology neutral, product neutral, and can apply to anything. So you can pick an open source license, one of the OSI approved ones, and use it for anything you want. Software, but people have also made open source houses, and open source drinks, and open source food, and open source cars. OK, so now that we have this idea of what open source and free software is, and again, if you've seen these two definitions, they're really very, very similar. It's more of a nitpicking on, on the definition. Let's look a little bit um, at, um, at, at how this brings to, to the, 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 the forced revolutions. Um, this is here a little bit of food for thought. Um, when I talked about open source license, I like this definition. Um, it's an open source license gives you the permission in advance, right? You don't have to sign a license. It's there. You use it. You have the permission in advance to by using, studying, improving, and sharing code. But it also comes with obligations for developers making use of it. Keep in mind that where we're talking free software and open source and freedoms to do things, they come with obligations. If you modify source code of a GPL software, you have the obligation to contribute those modifications back if you distribute the source code. So it's not just a question of giving you permissions and freedom, it's also constraint of what you can do with the software, but those constraints come from the idea of making this more available to more people. So, in, um, in the 1970s, there was a change in the way the industrial world uh, was working, and, and some new ways of doing things, some new technologies appeared. And after the fact, back in 2011, a person called Jeremy Rifkin coined a term, he called what happened in the 1970s the third industrial revolution. And basically he looked at what happened and realized that suddenly things started becoming, well, first of all, electronics uh, became more widespread. So we've seen the gadgets, the, the phones, the, uh, um, which by the way, in the 1970s, phones, remember, cable, you could walk around with your phone, but only a meter or two. Um, 
Anybody here has, still have a phone with a cable? I, I don't. Honestly, I don't. Even at home, it has a radio, right? Um, computers uh, became suddenly more widespread. I got my first personal computer in 1977, uh, something like that. Um, and, and the first one that I bought with my own money was 1980s. It was a TRS-80. My parents sort of gone crazy because it cost more than a salary, a month of salary. Um, but uh, you could say that around this period, personal computers became, became a reality. Telecommunications um, boomed. They went from cable to, to cableless, uh, to transferring not only voice but data. Um, and energy uh, suddenly became so easy to access in many places, not necessarily everywhere, that you can finally rely on having constant energy. And by the way, constant energy is a really strong uh, element of running computers. Uh, they don't like interruptions in energy. Um, if, if you turn off a computer while it's doing computation, it doesn't go on really well. So in 2011, Jerry Rifkin saw what was going on since the 1970s and basically said, okay, this is a change. This is really a, a, a major shift in ways we're doing things. So he coined the term revolution, the third one. Uh, third Industrial Revolution. And so, what was happening during then is that, as I mentioned, you know, we, we saw the computing world, the appearance of, of these open source licenses in, in the, the 1970s and 80s. The internet started um, taking on um, quite a bit of importance, and if you, if you remember or if you know, uh, the internet is governed by something called an RFC, right? An RFC is called is a request for comment. It's a it's a document that's written by somebody who wants to propose a way of doing things on the internet. It's reviewed very much like a university uh, review mechanism, and when it's accepted, it becomes a de facto standard. What is interesting about this is all of these standards that define the internet are open. They are either open standards or defined by open source reference implementations, right? So without um, without open source all of the internet that, uh, that we're using today probably wouldn't appear. We'd still be stuck running uh, uh, X25 networks in Europe or token ring networks in American uh, businesses, and, and systems would only be talking to systems that they knew and, and not to anywhere on the planet. So, so with the, the arrival of the RFCs, uh, the, first, the first internet protocols that everybody could use appeared. Um, I, I remember a time when we went and talked to banks and told them about using the internet for, for running business. And they were so stuck in their old way of doing things. They were looking at us and said, you guys are crazy. We're using uh, token ring networks to connect our computers because it's secure, and you want us to have the banking information to go over the internet through universities, through machines nobody knows, from one bank to another bank, and everybody's going to be able to see it. You guys must be crazy. Um, and we said, no, 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 no. There are ways to do that. There's things like VPNs and security protocols and things like that. So they started, uh, they started doing this. And look where we are today. Right? In the 1970s, the only way to use your money was actually to walk into a building um, and talk to somebody, which, by the way, has advantages, um, a lot of advantages. But it required you to be there from 9 to 5 and from Monday to Friday or Tuesday to, thir to Saturday mornings in France. And you couldn't do banking on Mondays in France or on Sundays. And now, with the arrival of these protocols, people can actually bank anytime, anywhere on the planet. I can, from here in Oman, I can actually talk to my bank in France, uh, and it works. <laughs> amazing, right? It works. Nobody thinks it's amazing in, in 2019, but believe me, in, in, in 1980, people were looking at us and saying, you guys must be crazy. You can't do banking from home. Hey, I'm doing banking from my pocket with my phone today, right? So this is, this is a, a huge change, and all of the industries around this time, uh, because of the arrival of these open protocols for communicating and, and, and these new systems they could rely on that were interconnected everywhere, uh, finally brought uh, the, the capability to everybody, uh, and, and I'm not going to talk blockchain and Bitcoin here, but come to me later, um, but everybody could do transactions and, 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 and work and shop, by the way, uh, shop uh, from anywhere, anytime uh, on the planet. So this is where the first web servers appeared as well, the CERN HTTPD, again, open source, if we're 
able of, to sign up for the conference today because some guys at CERN created an open source web server. Um, and finally, the first commercial internet. 1994 in France, I don't know when it was uh, in Oman, but before 1994, the only way you could connect to the internet was to implement open source protocols, connect to somebody else who was connected to the internet, and share your connection to somebody else who wanted to connect also. And that was nice for universities, um, but in the business world, people weren't ready for doing that. So in 1994, around that time, uh, the first internet operators appeared that said, well, we will connect you to the internet, and you won't have to connect somebody else to the internet, but you'll have to pay for it. So that was the first commercial internet. Oops. Okay. So, so this is basically what happened and how this, this, this major uh, shift in the industry was made possible because of, of all this open source software. Now, if we arrive more or less today, we're in 2019, um, if, oh, I'm struggling here a little bit because we have something that was called the fourth industrial revolution in 2016 by the World Economic Forum. I met three weeks ago I hadn't planned for that, actually. I was in a conference, and suddenly I realized that Rifkin was there. And, like, and he was talking about the, the, uh, the, uh, the third Internet revolution, and he talked about the fourth Internet revolution. He said, there's no such thing. Okay, so the guy who invented the third Internet revolution thinks we're still in the third Internet revolution, in the third Industrial Revolution. We have a little bit of a difference that sort of says it's a new thing happening, right? And that's why the World Economic Forum calls it the fourth industrial revolution. I think we're in this kind of world where people say it's Internet 2.1, 2.0, Internet 3.0. It's still the Internet. We've still changed the world. It's still an, in, an industrial revolution. And it's probably a new phase, whether we call it the fourth or we call it the third and a half or soon the fifth. I don't know. Um, but what has happened since 2000 and, and you know, 15, 16-ish, is that suddenly you take everything we've put in place since the 1970s, the connectivity between systems, the possibility to share information, and you turn that into not a possibility, but a standard way of doing things. And I think that is the major shift, right? Before 2015, you could. Since 2015, 2016, everything is. There is no discussion anymore. Ooh, one minute. So, all of this is powered by the fact that we're running all of this open source software that's been made available on systems. Um, we're talking blockchain as well, right? Blockchain is all powered by open source. I don't think there are more than 1% or 2% of the blockchain power, uh, platforms that are commercial and not open source. Everything else, Bitcoin, Stellar, Ethereum, Hyperledger, they're all open source projects. IoT world, one of the key elements of the, the, the next... Uh, the fourth industrial revolution, is all powered by open source. Machines talk to each other using standard protocols. And so, um, if, you look, if you look at, at what's happening here, um, it's really more of a turning the third industrial revolution into a way of doing things and not just saying it's a revolution. And I think that's what makes the fourth industrial revolution. So, in order to conclude, um, I want to say one thing. We're all here to talk about open source. We're all here to talk about innovation. We are going to make the revolution. We are going to create new things. We're going to, to share our knowledge. We're going to share it because we want to make everybody benefit from it. We want to make anybody capable of learning from it. That is the revolution. Sharing, connecting, making sure everything talks to everything. And we're here for that. So please, you know, during this event, think about that. You are the ones who are making the revolution. It's not just technology, it's what you do with it. Thank you very much.